So what's up, people? Welcome back to the channel. So today we have got a very special guest with us. Uh, he's been a youth coach. He's been a goalkeeping coach. He's been an assistant coach. He's been the head of youth. He's been a manager. He's been a technical director. He's been a pundit, and now he is a uh, he is in uh, educator for AIFF. Uh, we are talking about Pradhum Reddy, sir. Uh, how are you, sir? Welcome to the channel, sir. I'm very well, Pandan. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to this. Uh, sir, how are you actually? How are you, and what you are doing currently? Because I just put out the list. I I looked through your LinkedIn and found that you have been doing these jobs over the years. So, what are you currently doing, actually? If you could tell our audience, um, quite a bit of things actually. Um, it's obviously the off season now, so there's a little bits, little bits and bobs that you can do to sort of keep. Um, yourself occupied and, and busy. Um, the last thing you mentioned is one of the things that I'm involved in, which is coach education with the AFF. So I've been part of some committees for the C and the D licenses to revamp them, and um, and obviously due to the pandemic, a lot of things have had to go offline, and we've had to do some online courses. So part of the uh, structure of how to do the courses online and. and actually conduct some of the courses um, online as well um, the other thing as you mentioned was the goalkeepers mm. so as part of a committee with the AFF goalkeeping coaches as well to introduce an introductory goalkeeping license online so in the off season that's one of the on the education aspect that's the one of the things that I've been doing um, in terms of obviously it's transfer season in the next two days it closes it's very busy time so I'm advising um one particular club in uh, at the moment and obviously I speak to other clubs and um, so you're always busy during this time in a way of adv offering advice or consulting in terms of player movements uh, and obviously you get your ex-players and other players contacting you mm -hmm. as well so that's a little bit of a, a busy aspect and yeah the last couple of weeks there was the AFC Cup game so still keeping that side of it did the uh, a couple of games with Anand the other day um, AFC Cup games the Bengaluru game mm -hmm. the at ATK Mohan Bagan game. And um, yeah, looking forward to those games, looking forward to the India friendlies against uh, Nepal as well. So keeping myself as busy as possible, given the fact that there's no action, you know, there's no competitive football going on at the moment. So it, actually, it seems like you're more busy in the off season than in the, ma in the season. <laughs> actually, you're doing so many things together. So like, as, as you have mentioned that like, you know, Previously, what happened? You were you were educated with AIF. If you know that, like, when when people come for training, especially for coaches, it's very difficult to teach online. How the process is going? Can you can you can you just get a little of insight? A little of insight. Uh, yeah, I think. See, initially, we realized that um, you can't just take the licensed courses online. Um, you can't do your D licenses and C licenses, etc., online. So that's one of the reasons why the licenses weren't being conducted but then at the same time you see a lot of coaches are obviously stuck the, the coaches who are working in youth football especially um, pretty much youth football had stopped in India during the pandemic uh, the only thing that happened was um, the second division qualifiers the the I league in a bubble the ISL in a bubble mm -hmm. but um, the youth leagues all stopped so a lot of the youth coaches are actually missed out almost just like the, the young players they missed out on one year of their development as coaches so there's a Amongst a lot of the coach educators, I felt that there's a need for a couple of things. One is to offer courses which can help people online just learn or push them in a direction where they can gain more knowledge on things to do. And the second thing was the way the licenses have been restructured now that everyone has to have these continuous um, professional development or CPD points, if you want to call it. So to keep your licenses active between doing your C license to your B to your B to your A, et cetera. So in an ideal world, you'd be outdoors doing these refresher courses on the field, but it's not an ideal world at the moment. So I had to come up with ways of doing courses, which is not boring because, you know, I mean, there's, there's only so many podcasts we can all listen to and um, yeah. keep yourself engaged, but somehow manage to get the audience. So it makes it interactive. So it's not, yeah. us it's not a lecture. It's not us talking to candidates on online. It's us throwing suggestions out there and having interactions like what we're going to have now with you yeah, like absolutely. having a back back and forth with the candidates mm -hmm. so that you get an understanding of what they need and what 
difficulty they're facing. At the same time, look, coaching is about opinions. It's not one person telling you this is how you should coach. It's about learning from one another. So even as instructors, we pick up things from the candidates and vice versa. Actually, you said a very good point that you know, you're guiding people as well. For Like me, I am very into football coaching and I am very into analytics. Analytics, I, I think, but I watch a game for my YouTube channel as well. I watch a game for four or five times to get what, to know what happened in, in a game for the first 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I spend a lot of time doing that. So for, for people like me also, I believe you you guys are like AIFF and the collaboration with you are doing something so that people like us could, could get a higher bit of knowledge so that they can push forward for like after, before, after, like after they could go on for licensing. So I would like go on to Dibban. Dibban, if you could question the first, ask the first question. Hello, sir. Hi. Hello, Dibban. Uh, so I, I was researching about your whole career. I got to know that you were born in Scotland. Uh, and um, us as an outsider, when we watch the Scottish game, we see clubs like Celtic, Aberdeen and Rangers, all these clubs. So while you were growing up, uh, were you a huge supporter of Celtic or Rangers? What was your whole exposure to the game or yeah, Scottish football? Uh... Although I was born in Scotland, I've only lived there for, I think, about six months to a year. So I was about one year old and my parents moved south to the UK, uh, to England. So I haven't really seen um, much Scottish football. I'd probably say I went supported English football more than Scottish football. But then over the years, I've had a lot of um, colleagues that I worked with from Scotland. Um, a lot of Scottish coaches and um, almost did a couple of my coaching licenses. I didn't in the end, but I, um, I actually applied with the Scottish FA because they had a, a different path of how their coaching courses were structured compared to the English FA. Um, so I have um, got a fair bit of knowledge of um, Scottish football from that aspect. Um, I don't particularly have any um, uh, favorites. reference in terms of Rangers and, and, and Celtic. No favorites between Rangers and Celtic. Um, yeah, no, no allegiances. Uh, if I was to support my local team, considering where I was born, it should be a, a small club called Queen of the South. So <laughs> that would be my okay. team in Scotland. If you were, to, if you were to put me down on a on a, on a team. So, in Premier League, who who you rooted for in the Premier League or in English football? Um, I think see, I mean, you grow up. I mean, everybody picks a club, supports a club when living down. Like I, you typically support the club. Um, yeah. Like I support the club that my brother uh, used to support, but then. On my first, this is way back in 1999, uh, when I did my first coaching license with the FA, I remember one of my tutors said something along the lines of, you, now, you, now you want to become a coach, you stop looking at football like a fan and you start looking at like, um, professional you know, as, as a coach. So you start analyzing irrespective of whether you like, uh, you know, you start looking at it rationally rather than with a, um, a like a bias that you would have as a supporter. And pretty much sort of ever since then, I don't really support any particular club. I mean, I admire, um, so a club that I might admire, then a few years later, I might not admire them because a different coach has taken over and a different way of playing and philosophy. So I'm, uh, I don't have any particular allegiance at the moment um, to any club. And I, you know, I think there's a lot of good managers out there and you can pick and choose bits from each one rather than sort of be a fan and just be fixated on, you know, I'm obsessed with the way X, this particular team plays. Yeah. So, hmm. Dibba, you were so asking... Another, hmm. Yeah. So Dibba, another aspect of your uh, coaching career was that you went to the States to coach for a little bit of time. Uh, in the early 2000s, I guess. Uh, yeah. So the early 2000s wasn't a great time for uh, US soccer. I won't say that. I would say that. Uh, they didn't have many huge stars in the world of football. But now, uh, they have got players like Pulisic, uh, Reyna and Desk. So, while you were there, did you see this uh, uh, shift coming into their football? So, anything the coaches did especially well? Did you see something? Uh, did you preempt this thing would happen? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to take credit for Pulisic. <laughs> no, but... Um... Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Dipa. And I think um, if you look at it, like we we're talking about 20, 22 years ago, I, when I finished my first co coaching lesson with the FA, I had options of uh, you know, looking to work in different places. And 
my tutor had actually suggested that I go to America because I could work with different age groups in the same week. For example, I could have an under 10 team on a Monday, under 10 team on a 12 team on a Tuesday and 14s on a Wednesday, for example, and on Saturday coach all three. So in the course of, um, let's say, a 10-week season um, or three months in America, I would have gained experience working with three different age groups um, or, or more, depending, obviously. And so I'd spent four months in America, four months in India, and four months in the UK working with youth. And at the time, trying to make a living just on coaching in the UK was going to be difficult. Trying to do it in India was even more difficult way back in 1999. And I'm talking talk about coaching youth. And America was a, a logical step because, as you said, football wasn't they didn't have the superstars, but it was very big at the youth level. They had a lot of participation, but they didn't have many qualified coaches. So it was a, which is perfect for people like ourselves from the UK where um, we could go over there with our qualifications. Obviously, we speak the language. And we got to work. And, and the, the good thing about the American system was you didn't have to be an ex-player, which in, in England, especially in certain other countries, yeah, and a lot of other countries where mm. if you're not an ex-player, people don't look at you seriously as a coach. Whereas there you could, it was more of a merit-based system. So you could start with, I started with some of the youngest kids. Uh, I, I coached um, five-year-olds and I've coached with, uh, at a, uh, assisted with academy teams. Mm. And if you impress, you work your way up and, and you know, you're on, you, the sky's the limit in terms of where you can end up based on your coaching ability. So it was a good 10 years that I, that I had there. So, um, and from my, if I look at from 2000, when I first went out there to, 2009, when I when I left the US, huge, huge changes in terms of, uh, especially on the women's side of the game, which which I coached as well. There, huge improvements. By by then, they were the best in the world, um, winning World Cups, winning yeah. Olympics. And to be fair, I think there was this period where they were actually we we would get banter, obviously, from the the kids and the people we'd work with, who would say the Americans are doing better than the better than England because there was a stage where I think America qualified for three quarterfinals or went to the World Cup continuously and made the mm. quarterfinals three World Cups in a row and England hadn't. So I think there's, you can see the effects of investing in youth football and now it's showing rewards. I mean, you know, Pulisic is just one example, but there's so many American players playing in Europe now and so many. Before it was primarily goalkeepers in the Premier League. Um, you know, you had the Casey Kellers, you had the uh, Brad Friedels, and then yeah. Tim, you know, Tim Howard. Tim Howard. Tim Howard. Howard, 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 yeah. Tim Howard. No, Tim, not only Zach, Af- Zach, Zach, what's his name? The Manchester Stefan, City. Stefan. Second. Stefan, Stefan. Yeah. Stefan is also from. But now yeah. you're getting outfield players as well. So yeah. it's it's not yeah. just it's not just goalkeepers. Yeah. Uh, so, so Actually, sir, I mm-hmm. would like to uh, add a supplementary question to that. So investing in youth football sure, sure. would be the way for India to prosper. Do you think youth football can make India prosper in this field, like uh, America did in the 2000s? Do you think uh, we replicate to can, can we copy that, that structure from America and implement it in India? See, so I think you. Um, in terms of, I'll agree with the first part of it, saying yes, we should uh, try and obviously improve, increase all levels of participation at youth levels in Indian football, structure it a lot better, uh, etc. Um, but I wouldn't copy it because the biggest mistake a lot of developing countries and developing football countries especially make is to copy paste mm-hmm. something that works in another country. You can't take what works in Germany and put it in India. You can't take what works in Japan and just plug and play it in India. It doesn't work. So certainly the American model wouldn't work because don't forget Football in America, or soccer as they call it, is not their number one sport. It's their number four sport, probably. And granted, it's not the number one sport in India as well. But the, the demographics of who plays soccer in America is largely more affluent people. So hmm. it's a pay-to-play model. I don't think a pay-to-play model will work outside of the metro cities in India. The big cities, maybe, maybe to an extent, tier two cities in India could work. But... Even in, let's say, tier one cities, you would miss a lot of the core population in Kolkata, yeah. for example, if you made it a primarily pay-to-play model. 
So I think you can, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'd say you can't copy paste it. But certain things I'd love it if they copy paste it. Like I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I had a, when I left in 2009, I was working, um, I had a very, two very good uh, girls teams, an under 15 and an under 14 team. And I was also an assistant coach at a division one college team. Our schedule for younger kids, I knew that we would play 10 league games in the spring season, 10 in the fall season or around the, you know, after mm-hmm. the summer. Autumn. And so there's 20 minimum league games, plus cups, we'd have about 30 games. I knew which tournaments we were probably going to apply to at which time of the year and what we were going to do in the winter. And in terms of the college, I could tell you the fixtures for two years ahead of time. You come here in 2010 when I was at Shilong Lajong, you, you know your team's going to take part in the second division of the I-League. You don't know when it is. <laughs> we found out it'll probably be in April. I joined in August. So the question then was, what do I do between August and April? And you don't know what you're doing month to month. And nothing has improved in that aspect since 2010. The I-League has been played at a different start date every single year since 2010. It's never been the same format. The format changes. Um, so the teams pull you know, out. Yeah, teams, like you, you, you guys watch the Premier League. We can all look forward to and say, okay, August, first few weeks, Premier League is going to start. Yeah. Right? Spanish League is going to start on this day. You know when it's going to end. You know, Cup Final is going to be in May. You know, it's going to be here. We, we don't know. So it's very, very difficult to plan whether you're a player, whether you're a coach, whether you're a club administrator, or anything. It's very, very difficult to plan because you don't know. So I think in terms of youth sport, coming back to that uh, defense mm-hmm. question about youth, if we knew that youth football starts at this time of the year, finishes at this time of the year because of exams, brilliant, perfect. We, you, know, you can use it as a cutoff. Then we have summer holidays. Now, granted, we have difficulties in India because the school calendar is not the same in Manipur as it is in Kerala or it's Punjab as it is in Chennai. Right, we have little differences in the calendars of the years when we break for vacation. But roughly speaking, board exams take place normally at a certain time of the year, normally around March, April, if I'm not mistaken. And you can plan accordingly. Uh, you can start, uh, you know, obviously weather plays a factor as well. You can't, um, you guys, I think, I think most of you are based in Kolkata. Uh, yeah, yeah. This time of the year, the grounds are more like mud puddles. It's mm-hmm. difficult to start. Similarly, in the Northeast, um, similarly in large parts of the country, even in Goa, it's going to be slushy at the moment. So th- there are factors which mean you can't have one calendar for the whole of youth in India. But I don't see why regionally, why each state couldn't have their own calendars and time, rough timelines whereby teams should play their youth football. Um, and I think we're still a long, long, long way away from that. Actually, sir, I can give you an example about it because, you know, uh, we, me and Dibban were from the same college and, you know, we participate in the Reliance Cup every year. So, like, and I, we know that there is talks in going about the Reliance Cup, which is held to be in October. And now it's almost September. There's only one month. Like, we are participating. We are not, like, going to win the league. We know that for a fact. But... The thing is that for teams that have been the teams, there are teams, there are teams, there are players who want to win the competition. There are quality players. How are they going to prepare? You, you don't know if the competition is going to be in one month or not. You have to prepare. It's not like two days ago, you go out there and practice for uh, an hour and two and then go and play the next game. It's not possible, no. especially for a, in India, especially, yeah. It's basic, uh, basic Indian rate tapism. You have to get it approved by uh, hundreds of people, and then you can make it happen. So, yeah, it's another factor. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you talked about Shillong Lejong. Your first role as a coach, you came to India after, like America. I presume that you generally worked with the youth team, basically yeah. youngsters. And others. So you came to India and took over a second division club called Shillong Vejong, which was, I believe, not known 
for like most of us you didn't knew about the club back then when you took over yep and i believe you took it from say second division club and you promoted them to first division you made them play the i league and i if i am not mistaken you also uh, took them to the federation cup semi finals yes yeah i think the, the 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 first year was as with the club was fantastic i mean it was my first of a professional mm-hmm. club job and you're absolutely right at my prior experiences primarily with the youth at done some work with college uh, as an assistant for 3 years in america but in terms of professional men's teams it was first role and yeah the first year was brilliant we got to the uh we won the second division second division our first mm-hmm. attempt uh like my 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 first attempt sorry and we qualified for the i league we reached the semi finals of the fed cup a month later we reached the semi finals of the durand cup um mm-hmm. on both occasions we lost to the the eventual winners which were salgaokar and churchill at the time who were obviously much much bigger clubs and bigger budgets but yeah it was, mm. it was a terrific uh, first you know, introduction to indian football so how how's the transition been like you as you said that there are players you know when you came to india you talked about it like when you took over the job you didn't know that when the tournament's going to start like who you going to facing and what's what's the state when you first saw the team you knew that you were going into somewhere that you know it's not as much as developed as they at is was in us or uk but were you surprised by their level so you were a bit underwhelmed seeing the players see i actually visited shillong in hmm. may the previous uh, april may the previous season when they were in the i league and they were fighting to stay in the i league and it was their first season in the i league uh, and they mm-hmm. were going to get relegated they were they were on bottom when i went they beat the top team which is mahindra then they uh, drew with mumbai and what fascinated I me mean, i just went to work with their youth at the time but what impressed me the most was the stadium was packed it was 28000 people it was absolutely full and there were probably 5 6000 people outside who wanted to get in and couldn't get in so i felt okay if you're going to coach in india this is the place to be this is where people love football they're passionate about it and um that's that's what tempted me when the, when the uh, unfortunately when they got relegated when the job came up i jumped at the chance because i felt it's the best place to work because you've got football you're surrounded by football and so even though it actually started off as a two month i'm going to help help the club just mm. get set rather than i was going to good join um and the two months went very well and the owner offered me a, a five year contract but uh the, the beauty about being in the northeast is you've got as i said you've got football surrounding you everywhere you've got even though we didn't have any idea when the second division is going to start start you you don't have to worry about that because you've got a local league match next week so the local league is going on the shillong league you've got youth mm. players playing in that you've got your reserves playing in that um you you're playing against royal wind or you're playing against arima you're playing against langs mm. these are teams that will play in the second division so it's good quality opposition they've got foreign players and and it's it's tough and the fans are, the, are on you you can't lose these games every games are a must win similar to like what um kolkata ah. league is yes cfl and the moment in those days you'd get a fax in your office you know this is or you guys are probably not born when faxes were there but uh, this is pre email days so you'd get a fax from an aff or a sam football association saying tournament whether mm-hmm. to bordeloi cup in guwahati or sikkim governors cup in sikkim do you want to take part and these are the conditions so we'd always put up our hand and say yep we'll come so you'd request your local league to give you change in your fixtures for 2 weeks and then you travel up to Sikkim let's say for a tournament and you don't know when you're coming back because it's knockout so you could lose first game you get out of your group if you if you don't get out of your group you're coming home so you don't book your return ticket if you the next day you got a quarter final game you win you stay on you go to the semis you lose you're back home because you cl- they don't pay you beyond when you're in the tournament so you have to come back you can't stay back and say oh, i'm going to scout the other team and watch some players you basically have to jump on the the next train and come back to to shillong via guwahati so that's the nature of indian football in those days you'd go to different invitational tournaments we played in 
And this is we were we oh, don't forget we're based in Shillong. We played in Sikkim. We played in upper different parts of Assam. We played in Mizoram. Uh, we split the team and went to Manipur. We went to Kerala. We went to Pune, Orissa, anywhere, anywhere there was a tournament. So we made our own calendar basically, and mm. we basically did that until the second division started. So even though there was no ten month league for us, we made our own ten month league. I, I played. I easily must have played thirty to forty games in my first season. That was a pretty long, pretty season, preseason. So yeah, after I mean, that, it's but it's a competitive preseason because every match counted. So pressure's on in every match. Everybody wants to win. It's every team wants to win. No teams yep. like you know. Let's experiment with the squad and not not this type of things. So you were uh, after the first season, I believe you were the you head of youth development in Shillong Lejong. um seeing like no owners i believe give you the role so yep. like you always say that there were pretty many youngsters out the people are like enthusiastic about football and in a place where fo- football is uh, is primarily the first sport in shillong considering there yep. must be many youngsters who are like immensely talented and want to get into the team and they love the game what was your experience like you know you've been uh uh you trained american youth you've been seeing have have seen the uh, youth in uk what's what's the difference between them and india so i think those days um you you'd look at the youth players and you'd realize they've got you know a lot of ability in terms of you know their technical ability was decent um in terms of the top players abroad Uh, at the same age group probably not a match um they were a few notches below um uh, the desire and work rate was certainly there um uh, you 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 talk about in those days lajong only used to recruit players from the northeast and uh, they had a club policy so but the advantage was there were no other high league teams or top division teams in in the northeast so the best players from mizoram used to come to Shillong possibly the best youth mm. in that region and which is as as we all now know the best one of the best regions in in indian football yes so you definitely had a lot of players to pick from and you had to be careful and smart about which players you picked um but tactically you could see that they were a little bit behind um in terms of if you if you were to make direct comparison to the kids abroad and that's purely just because of lack of structured games that they had played over the years but you always felt like if you gave some of these youngsters the right chance at the right um and right kind of coaching that they could go on to to do very well not just for lajong but eventually for one of the bigger clubs because you couldn't hold on to them um, you're going to lose them to a big club eventually yeah. and hopefully one day the idea was that you'd start producing players that could go on to play for the country absolutely so uh, after that you left shillong and you joined uh, dsk shivayans i believe a um, club in i think it was affiliated to liverpool back then uh, if i'm not mistaken depend you can back before well, when i joined before. it wasn't yeah you were, it wasn't so i i know it no, from the fact I, I play a lot of football manager <laughs> back in fm 2004 2014 i believe it was like it was showing that it was affiliated it might be a okay. game no no, no. Bug, you, I, I, 2000, i think 2014 it was um i joined in january around january february of 2013 hmm. and the, it, at that time it was just a they hadn't played anywhere apart from pune it was just hmm. a small pune club that had ambitions with an ambitious owner to do to do more um so he contemplated going for this direct entry option into the i league and i suggested if you're going to do it you might as well play the second division and try and qualify because if you qualify then you don't have to pay all that money to so why not let's exactly. let's just give it a go at qualifying so um unfortunately they, they didn't have a strong enough local team to do it so we recruited a couple of promising um young players that were like pylon arrows had 30 odd players in those days and just too many and i spoke to the coach and i said if 
if you don't need all these 30, I'll take some of them. So I think mm. I took about 10 players off of them. I spoke to Salgauk, a couple of other clubs who had what you could say players that weren't, mm. hadn't played much in the first half of the season. Um, so by January, they were willing to loan them out. Or Yeah, so we picked up, s- smartly, we picked up some players from different clubs like that. And we, we competed in the second division. Unfortunately, we couldn't qualify. We only lost one game, but we didn't, mm. uh, we didn't make it out of the group. So, yeah, so, yeah that was uh, Dil Shivayans, and I, I believe Shuankar will take it over. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, so my question is that uh, on 2013, uh, it was confirmed that you had left DSK Shivayans and joined uh, Bangalore FC of the I League. Uh, as assistant coach. Uh, so, what was your experience coaching this team? Um, so, yeah, I think when I was at DSK, there was a talk about obviously a new team coming in in Bangalore. And so, when I met with the owners, had the interview, and I think everyone knows these, the story, but um, they were impressed with the plan that I had laid out mm. for the Bangalore FC. So, immediately they pretty much, so by the time I got back, um, two days ago, they called me and said, "Can you come back for a second, for a second day, and then confirm me the job?" And we got work immediately because don't forget, a lot of the I League teams were set, so any brand new team coming in, you had to pick players that weren't already signed with other clubs. Mm. So quite a few players from DSK actually came with me, um, the likes of Shankar, Keegan, Siam Hangul. Um, Quite a few, I think about four or five players came with me from DSK Shivajins. And once again, it was just a matter of picking players which some clubs had felt maybe weren't in their plans or uh, some, some clubs had felt this player's not good enough anymore. And we felt if we give him the right environment, we could improve him. And I think, as you know, the rest, as they say, with Bengaluru's history, yeah. Actually, about Bangalore, like it was your first time experiencing uh, experiencing in Indian football about a club, a station like Bangalore, where you can't lose a game. In Shillong, there was you know you can lose to East Bengal, Mohan Bagan, or big clubs, but with Bang- a club like Bangalore, you can't lose to anyone. You like what was the pressure like when it's okay? You can play good football in Bang in Lejong was pretty much like you know you can play good football and people are happy with playing however playing. But with Bangalore, you don't care about playing. You have to win every game that there is. Well, funnily enough, Spandani wasn't like that in the beginning. Um, when in the first season, nobody expected hmm. us to, uh, to win the league. I, I, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'll, I think I've said this a couple of times before. I, I, we'd put the contracts and, and built incentives into the players' hmm. contracts in such a way that they were coming on a a respectable base salary, but they had very good incentives. So you had win bonuses, you had clean sheet bonuses, you had goal bonuses, assist bonuses, and huge bonuses if you won the title. And I remember saying mm-hmm. that you realize that if we win the league, it's going to cost the club a lot more than what the initial budget is. Mm-hmm. And the response to that was, trust me, if we win the league, the owners won't have any problem <laughs> paying, paying that. So nobody from the coaching staff to players, certainly not like Sunil Chetri didn't believe uh, at the time and neither did uh, mm. the owners, neither did us. I'll admit I didn't. Uh, none of us coaching staff and anybody associated with the club felt we're going to be contenders, let alone win it. Nobody thought we'll finish top three. Brand new club. For us, as long as we didn't finish bottom, because we, we couldn't get relegated mm. directly. As long as we finished respectable mid-table, we'll build on that for the second season. That was the plan. What happened in the first season just exploded, um, both in terms of how well we played on the field, how well everyone at the club worked to get the fans in and then connect with the fans and build that fan base. So everything was just this like a perfect storm. And then mm. after that, yeah, I'll agree to your point. Then the second season onwards, expectations go through the roof. Then all of a sudden, losing home and away to East Bengal is considered, you know, Sin. not a good thing. But reality is you're a one, one-year-old club. You're losing to a, uh, you know, 
a hundred year old. There's, there's, there's no shame in it. Yeah, there's, there's no shame in that whatsoever. And they were a very strong team, and they're always contenders for the league. But mm-hmm. such was the um, change in expectations, and yeah, that's that's what happens in football. You start winning, and then people change. Perspective, you know, about. So, so, Ankar, uh, you, hmm. so you said the name of Sunil Chetri. How was it like working with him, with Sunil Chetri and all the big names? So, yes, I, look, it's it's no footballers are footballers, right? So as coaches, you don't treat them as big name or anyone else. First game of the season, Sunil Chetri was on the bench, right? And I think um, as coaching staff, I would treat. Sunil, the way exact same way as I would treat a 19-year-old in the squad. And I think initially he was probably surprised by that, that he, you know, there wasn't that culture at, at, at that particular, at Bangalore at the time where we didn't give that, that respect to, oh, he's a senior player, he's this, he's that. Everyone was treated the same. You work mm-hmm. hard. You're in the squad. You don't work hard. Um, you know, we used to have a players used to vote at the end of training the day before match day, and whoever was the worst player had to wear the we had a yellow bib, like a pink bib kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he had to wear it on the bus, he had to wear it to the game, and some days he ended up having to wear it because of players vote. So I think but that, that's what made the club stronger, that's what made him a better player. Um and if you look at his performances since um 2013, he's gone on to become mm-hmm. an even even better player. Absolutely. I mean, you, you like Bangalore instigated that no one is irreplaceable in the squad kind of attitude, which was previously missing in Indian football to be very impressive. Yeah. So, Sorry, I, think, I just didn't hear that this connection. Was... Yeah. I was saying that uh, before, like, uh, before 2013, before Bangalore, people were like, you know, he's a big player, he just can't be replaced. The concept of no one is irreplaceable is pretty new in Indian football. And that was why I think probably your Bangalore team was the first one to like you know to replicate that and that gave performances and results on the pitch as well. So uh, after that, um, after that you moved to you know uh, after that after uh, you stayed at Bangalore for a couple of years, I believe. Uh 2016, I believe you stayed in Bangalore three years, yeah. And then you moved to, to Pune City as an assistant coach. And that was your first time experience in the ISL. So ISL and I League and ISL was formed like in two, three years ago, I believe. Like two, two, two years, yep. three years ago, I believe. 2014 it was formed. So that was, I think, uh, the third or fourth season of ISL. And you went to Pune City. What was experience in ISL? Because, you know, uh, because in the first few seasons of ISL, there was a huge thing that, you know, it was going to be like the MLS or big players going to come, things like that. So was it any different, any different than I-League? What's your opinion on that? Um, so it was interesting. I think the second season of um, BFC ISL had started and I had a couple of offers to join some ISL franchise at the time. But um, it was wasn't tempting enough to leave because obviously Bangalore were in the AFC Cup. We we're playing in continental competition. You're playing games which other you know ISL teams weren't going to be able to play. So and their season was much shorter. So um, given the role and how much actual responsibility there would be, I felt uh, it's much more prudent to stay at Bengaluru and, and learn and, and improve and and keep winning. Of course, uh, we won something mm-hmm. every single year. Um, but when you could see by the time I was my third year at Bengaluru, by 2016, the ISL was starting to take more of a dominant force. So I felt mm-hmm. at some point I had to get my, you know, dip my toes in it to say, um, to, otherwise you could almost be, then people would start looking at, if you, if you did have to apply for a job in the ISL, they'd look at you and go, well, you don't have any ISL experience, mm-hmm. right? Because three seasons you haven't worked. So I helped uh, Delhi Dynamos out actually in 2016 with their recruitment. So mm-hmm. I just been having some trouble with uh, signing the right kind of Indian players. So um, I offered to help and brought in players like Keen Lewis, Mil- Milan Singh, Chinglan Sana, mm-hmm. 
Alvin George, I think uh, Ruatara and uh, Rupert Nongram and a couple and one, one to others, Zwala. And mm. and all the and those players did phenomenal. I think Keane was brilliant that season, as was Chinglin Senna. And uh, they they did really well for Delhi Dynamos who made it to the I think they were the first team to qualify that year for the playoffs and then they lost in the playoff semis. But so that was my first sort of foray, you could say, into ISL just as a consultant. And then, you know, there were other offers immediately after that to join a couple of other clubs. Um, mm-hmm. And unfortunately, um, you know, sometimes you just like a bit of a challenge. So I picked the I picked the least best performing team at the time, which was Pune, who had never made it to the playoffs. And, um, you know, obviously the first season we did very well. We made it, made it to the playoffs first time in their history. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult to answer your question about the difference. I mean, you're working, you've gone from the most professional club in India, the best run club in India at the time, um, Bengaluru, where everything works well. Everyone, you know, it's a proper football club. People work 12 months of the year. Everyone get, understands everyone else's role. And um, the people who are working there are football people. They understand. And you've gone from that to FC Pune City, which was, you could say, the exact opposite. Um, you know, for Worst people are not Yeah, I mean, see, so yeah, performance-wise, they were unlucky the first three seasons. They hadn't made it to the mm. playoffs. So, yes, statistically at that time, they were the worst team in the league. Um, but you start to unravel on why they were the worst team in the league. I mean, it, because, you know, it's no secret. If a team's performing badly, mm. there's obviously some reasons for it. And the people behind the scenes were the worst people who shouldn't be running a football club. Um, and that's, it's as simple as that. And that's why they were the worst performing uh, team and so there's a lot of things you have to to fix and and resolve and the first season we managed to do it but you could see why it was going to unravel and eventually shut down um, just, but it was a good experience in terms of it you in football you learn from from these experiences and you you know it, it makes you actually stronger because you have to overcome the hurdles that are suddenly thrown in front of you yeah actually you know uh, about that um you you are kind of a guy who loves the challenge, right? You you always like, as far as I have seen, like you you always take those underdog stories. You you are like a protagonist to those underdog stories. You you like those type of clubs like Shillong, Lejong, DSK, Bengaluru, clubs which haven't proved anything yet, and make them a success story. Yeah. So, the question, I believe. <laughs> Uh, so I think yeah, you were the technical director at Pune, I think. Yes. Yeah, so recently many Indians are opening up to the idea of a technical director, I think. So can you explain what a technical director did in the day-to-day running of a football club? Right. Um, so obviously it's different in every, every club in India, uh, different in clubs abroad. Um, I'll give an example of what it was like at, at Pune. Um, so at Pune, we had a pretty good uh, youth team at the time. Our under-18s were pretty good. They uh, made it to, in my first season, they made it to the semifinals of the... Um, well, no, they didn't... In the group stages, I mean, they made it to the final rounds mm. of the uh, under-18s. And we had some good teams in the group. Um, I think East Bengal's under-18s were in the group. Shillong Lajongs and... Um, I think East Bengal qualified to the only as a group winners. Mm. And you could see potential in a lot of these young players. And a few months, I think it was the following month, we played the IFA Shield, which was in those days a, a youth, it was under 19 tournament. Yes. And we, we won it, beating Mohan Bagan in the final. Uh, that mm. Mohan Bagan team um, had the likes of Deepak Tangri as captain. Mm. And so you could see that there were a couple of really good youth players in your team. So one of the roles as your technical director is you oversee the whole club. It's not just focusing on senior team, you look at what youth you have and looking at those youth players, you plan accordingly thinking that I've got a good, let's say a good left center back or a left, good left winger now, but realistically, will he play in my senior team or, you know, is Marcelino playing there or is there an Indian player who's playing in that position that's better than him, um, mm. etc. So you have to have, from a, from a just from the player's perspective, you have to have a holistic uh, look at it. And 
you know, it's easy to say, um, okay, Sebastian, who was our right back in the youth team, is not um, good enough for the senior team at the moment. But you don't want to just dismiss him because you've got, let's say, Asata Golu is a potential national team player and somebody else be added right back. So you've got to look at the player's overall development as well. So, you, for example, with, with some of those younger players, we felt let's loan them out to the I-League, let them get game time, let them get experience. So we actually loaned out about 11 to 12 players that season, in my first season, which was unheard of. No, no one in those mm. days, you wouldn't hear of ISL teams loaning players to... We actually put one of our own players in the draft and he was picked up by FC Goa, Yasir. So Yasir... Mm. development happened by him going to FC Goa and playing the Goa Pro League because Goa Pro League you get a, a full season he got to train with the senior team if he had stayed in Pune there's no Pune the Pune Super Division mm. I'm sure you guys can uh, compete in it and win it it's, it, it's not a very high standard right um, even at my yeah. age I can still play in it I'm sure um, the, so you have to think about how how will you get the best out of it. So even though sometimes you let the player go somewhere, you see it abroad, obviously. Top clubs do it. They loan their players out to get more game time and experience and bring them back. So we did that. We had some players, uh, Garo Bora um, and a couple of other boys went to Chennai City FC. They won the I-League with them, gained valuable experience. Some went to Niroka, some went to Kokulam. So that's one of the aspects of the technical director to oversee your player's development. Of your, especially your youth, because that's one of your only assets in an Indian football club is your is your youth players. Mm-hmm. Then the other aspects of things like helping planning, um, like from a budget point of view. Um, then in those days, there was a draft in the ISL, so the whole strategizing about how you pick the Indian players in the draft, which ones, how much valuations, etc. Um, that was one of the roles. Um, that's actually pretty, I find that pretty easy in, um, aspect, obviously, because that's something when you're normally working in the, as a, with a first team, mm. recruitment is something that you pay um, a lot of attention to. I did that at La Jong and DSK and BFC. Um, the other aspect is a lot of ISO clubs weren't thinking long term. They weren't thinking full season. They would just think for the four months that the ISL was. Or, so... To give you an example, like preseason in those days, in the first three seasons of ISL, every single club went abroad for preseason. Yes. They'd go to Spain, some would go to Thailand, some would go to the Middle East, some would go mm. wherever. South and, Africa and this. You know, so all, all sorts of Brazil, mm. everywhere. So yeah, to give um, to give an example of Pune, they'd been to uh, Italy, Fiorentina, mm. didn't make the playoffs, been to Spain. Mm. Didn't make the playoffs. Had been to Turkey in the season two. The top facilities, one of the top facilities where they went there, didn't make the playoffs. So I posed the question, why don't we do preseason in India? Mm. To which, of course, everyone's like, how can you do that? There's, the grounds are not good enough. The, you know, the usual opposition, which all the other clubs would have said. Yes. Well, the answer to that was, our ground is good. We had our own training ground. So you can't use that excuse. Our ground is good enough. Well, who will we play against? We'll, we'll play against teams in India. We'll play East Bengal. We'll play Mohan Bagan. We'll play a team from the Northeast. We'll play a Goa Pro, you know, a Salgaukar or a Sporting Goa or somebody. And then mm. we'll play an ISL team when they, when they all come back to India. Because eventually everyone has to come back. Mm. And if the initial reaction is, well, is that good enough? Like, you know, how will it help us play in the ISL if we play against... Um, a team from the Mizo Premier League or the team from Goa Premier League or Mohan Bagan, etc. Right? So you have to educate people in the club management as well. That, look, in terms of getting used to the conditions, playing in the weather in, I don't know, in the UK or some other places isn't going to be prepared for the ISL in India. Right? And the travel, the cost, etc. So eventually they did listen. We did play all those teams that I mentioned. And our last game of the season was against Chennai, Chennai and FC in Pune mm. on our training ground. And it was, I think we drew 2 2. Um, Bodo scored two goals for them. I think Alvaro mm. Alvaro and Martino scored for us. And 
And look, you know, everyone knows what happened that season. We made yes. the playoffs. Chennai made the playoffs. Chennai went on to beat Bengaluru in the finals. So there's... It, and then after that, if you look at it after that, a lot of teams in the ISL started having... It was the next season, I think it was almost 50-50. Or mm. at least two or three teams had pre-seasons in India. And now it's gotten to the point where I think it's almost 100%. Obviously, because of COVID, it has COVID, yeah. changed. But I think that might become the norm now. I don't think many teams will go abroad. So, just yeah, I, so these yeah. are just aspects that, like, like I said, second, but this, I mean, there's so many you could, um, you could list throughout the season. Don't forget, you've got to be um, continuously looking because you're going to have players that's contracts finish. You're going to have players that contracts finish in two years time. You're going to have players that you your head coach doesn't like, or you're going to have players who don't like the head coach and want to move on. Hmm. And so there's a lot of player movement that's going to happen. At the same time, I think you've got to balance that with looking at your youth, which is very tricky, as we mentioned earlier in India, because if there's no competitions to play, then how do you develop your youth? So, and each city's got their own problems. If you're a technical director of a club in Goa, it's a little bit easier with the Goa Pro League, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if you're the technical director of, let's say, the team of Odisha, where local league may not be as strong as the Goa Pro League. Um, so each each place poses obviously um, different kinds of issues like that, and yeah, I mean to a certain extent there's budget issues and and everything else which you have to to look into. And the other aspect which I think you were keen to talk about, Swandan, is coach development as well. Yes, your youth co your youth coaches. Like you might hire a couple of young coaches to work in your grassroots. Now, obviously, they're probably just maybe a D or a C licensed coach working with your grassroots, mm -hmm. but Eventually, obviously, they want to get their B, yeah, but, go on to their mm. licenses, eventually work with the senior team. So how do you help their career development um, as coaches? So you have to look at not just the players as a technical director. You also have to look at your staff. How is their professional development? You know, you sign an analyst. Great. In the four months of the ISL, he's clipping games. He's, he's giving you data. What does he do in the offseason? How does he mm. become? So when he comes back next season, how is he a better analyst than he was the previous season? Does he now know how to use not just sports code? Does he now learn how to use Catapult? Does mm. he know how to use different um, software, different sort of technology that you're going to be using the following season? Right. Um, the goalkeeping side of it. Um, every every sort of aspect. What do you do with your players in the off season? The Indian off season is longer than the. Season. So how Actually, do you, how do you? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, uh, some of some mm. players now have been off for seven months, six seven months. Right, apart from the the ones who played in AFC, um, some clubs players might have not played for seven months. So, how do you then manage that in the off season? So, there's a lot of aspects that sort of as a technical director that you'll have to keep your sort of finger on that pulse. I mean, I mean, the technical director term is now now after the after the take after the technical director. I believe a technical director won't you agree that a technical director's project should be long, not because only one season is the technical director. Because when you are appointing a technical director, he has a plan for five years. I want to see the club like that. Because you know you can't loan up eleven players and expect them to come next season and win the champ, win the league, or win the ISL or whatever. You must have a plan. And I don't think India in India we generally to do justice with those kind of technical directors. We just if not working for two seasons, you go out. This is a lot we are seeing. So, do you know the reason? Sure, but I think. Hmm. See, I think people in the past, as you mentioned, it's a new role. People weren't aware of whether there was a need for it because club officials used to say, I'll, I can do this or I'll handle that. They didn't want to hire somebody to do it. But when you start seeing clubs being successful, like I think if you look at Bangalore, um, Mandar has been there for now coming close to, uh, you know, he's part-time in the beginning, but now he's obviously full-time and it's more than seven years now. Um, eight years, more than eight years now. Mm. Uh, seven full-time, I'd say. Um, I think Ravi, who's been at um, FC Goa, has been there for more than more than four years. If you look at um, Sanjoy Sen, has been at uh, HK Mohan Bagan for more than a couple of years. years. Mm. I think two years. Um, but obviously, he's been associated with Mohan Bagan before that. So he knows the, the area and everything. He knows the club. I think 
Shabir Pasha has been involved for more than four or five years now at Chennai. So if you look at the clubs I've mentioned, those are the most successful clubs at the moment in the ISL. So it's no surprise that if you hire people and you keep them for long run, you will get success. So I think people are seeing that now and realizing the importance of having that stability because as you said, coaches will change every year. Players will change. Mm. Um, and then that's not just, that's not just Indian football. That's anywhere in the world. Even in the top, the Premier League, coaches do move on. Right? Even uh-huh. successful clubs. It's not the old way of like saying, oh, Ferguson there 25 years, Wenger there for so many years and you'll be successful. Mm. It's changed. Chelsea changes their manager every um, every couple of seasons, but they still keep winning, mm. right? So because so they start to realize. I think clubs are starting to realize that now and planning for a little bit better for the for the long term. So I think it steps in the right direction. It's true. Ah, uh, Dipan, I think you had a question about transfer window, which you can enlighten. Yeah, man, this transfer window has been quite dramatic. It means Messi going uh, this way, Ronaldo now going this way, Mbappe's deal, it, will it happen, won't it happen? So I wanted to ask, how is the Indian transfer window compared to the European transfer window? Us as football fans, we are more, glue, more interested about the European transfer window. But I wanted to know uh, back home what is the thing, what happens? Is there a Fab- Fabrizio Romano in the Indian transfer scene? I want to know that as well. <laughs> I actually think the Indian transfer market is more exciting for me, obviously, because I work in it. So uh, it's and it's great keeping keeping tabs on um, what's happening, who's moving, the rumors. I think it's it's great nowadays that there's a lot of young fans who interact, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram. So you'll you'll find out from different places. Obviously, some is true, some is rubbish. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that clearly the Fabrizio Romano of Indian football is Marcus Mergelo. Um, yes. I think Marcus, you, you follow Marcus on Twitter, you will, you'll have an idea. Um, and he's very well connected with his sources and you'll get um, an idea of who's going to which club and who's not going to which club. Um, and, you know, nine times out of ten, he's correct. So yeah, it's exciting. And, um, and I think it's exciting times to be in Indian football. Like ten years ago, it wasn't this buzz about who's going where or player announcements by a club. It's, you know, it's a player to go somewhere, people are okay. Um, whereas now there's a proper build up to it. There's social media behind it. There's videos, et cetera. So I think it's healthy for the, for the ecosystem. And um, I mean, yeah, there's about 48 hours to go now. Yeah, yeah. And there's 48 hours to go now in the window. So you'll see some interesting moves yeah. as well in the... Uh, Indian football as well in the next two two days. I I hope East Bengal could complete his team. <laughs> I just hope so, so that we can put up a team in the CFL. So, I yeah. just read some rumor rumor just now that uh, Daniel Sturridge might be going to East Bengal. So if that happens, then you know, <laughs> I would be pretty There you go. So... shirts. <laughs> My friend out here is a <laughs> Mondragon fan. He's a Liverpool fan as well, so he might be a dis- little disappointed. That would be a, that would be a nightmare, I think. That would be a nightmare. <laughs> it's just a rumor at the moment, so I just I just read that rumor somewhere. Yeah. So uh, about that, so we're talking about this, and you did a you also do panditry. This is something we haven't talked about so far. You also do panditry, and you did a panditry in like ISL, I believe you did panditry. And uh, how was experience like? You know, doing panditry. You, I I believe like. What what how is the, how it is different than being on the pitch, like you are a kind of guy who has always been on the pitch. How it's like to not support a team and pass your judgment as a neutral. How difficult is that? I think some of it's actually quite similar to what you do as a coach in a club, um, because. So you do your homework before you play any team. So if I was at Bengaluru and we're playing um, Kerala Blasters the next week, mm-hmm. you're going to watch the last three to five games of Kerala Blasters. You'll watch with your analysts, with your coaching staff. You'll, you'll look at little the way Kerala defends, the way Kerala attack, the way they transition, the way they set pieces. So you would do a detailed study on them. You will pass on that information to your players during video sessions. You'll do 
at the very least, you'll do two video sessions with your players during that build up to that um, game. And at that time, most of the time, I, in most of the clubs I've been, whether it's in Bangalore, whether it's Pune, I've stood up with a projector and, um, you know, a PowerPoint oh. presentation and gone through the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent, as well as what we need to do as a team to beat them. So some of that work, obviously, you do on the ground. So getting up and speaking about it as a pundit on TV is, is pretty much the same. The only diff, big difference is time, obviously, mm. um, and obviously the little... The, the TV aspect of it, but that you get used to. I think the trickier part with TV is you actually have to analyze both teams uh, in terms of you've got to do double the homework. So in a normal week in football club, you prepare for your opponent, then you prepare for the next opponent. Whereas when you're doing TV, you're preparing for two two teams every time you're going on air because you have to talk mm. about both, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of both. So there's a little bit more um, homework prep work, you can say, but there's less... You don't have to do it on the ground. There's pressure. Um, that aspect, that's pressure. Uh, uh, um, pressure is there because, look, if you, when you say something and if you're honest and if you're critical of someone, these, some of these players are players you've worked with before. Some of these players are players you're going to work with and they're friends of yours. Some of these are coaches mm. you coach against. So, uh, you obviously want to be as honest as possible, but at the same time, you, know, you don't want to be um, just digging people out for the sake of um, digging people out and putting them on the spot because we've all been there and it's not nice to have somebody pointing out your mistakes um, week in, week out um, and amplifying it. Um, so that's something you've just got to be a little bit sort of cautious about. Um, but I think it's uh, it, it's very enjoyable because it actually makes you Look, as, as you, I think Swandan, you were saying, when you sit and watch, watch a game, you're analyzing. It. That's what mm. all of us do whenever we watch. If you're a Liverpool fan, you're a Monbagan fan, you watch your own team and you think you have opinions about a certain player. You have an opinion about the way they're playing or what they should do. Every football fan's a manager, right? He, he's going to be saying, this guy should be substitute or why isn't he playing, etc. So all of us have that within us. Um, so you get to go on air or you get to stand and, and express that. I think it's 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 nice because it's um, you know, I've been in Indian football for more than ten years, so I have a vast knowledge of the players in this league and what's been happening in the league. So to be able to share that and you get good feedback um, most of the time, you get good feedback. Of course, you get criticism as well, which is you know that's part of football. Whether you're a coach, whether you're a player, whether you're a pundit, um, whether you're a coach educator, you're, you're not going to keep everybody happy. So that that's just part of it and. You just learn to have thick skin and get on with it. About that only, you were talking about uh, we four, I think, are here and uh, four, uh, four of our friends are there. We started like that. You know, in Bengali, we talk about chai adda. It's a term called chai adda. We, we take a cup of tea and we talk about everything from politics to football. Everything's out there. And we, we usually do did that in Discord. So I was t- telling you the other day, I would, we will do that in Discord and like one of us got the idea, why not post it online? You know, there's a platform, why not post it online? And that's what we do. Um, yeah. And that's that's how we started this channel, actually. And, but I just want to think about that. Like some, you told that some of the players you have coached, like it doesn't happen that if someone sees the video and you were criticizing him, he calls you up like, coach, what you are telling me? Are you, I wasn't good or something like that. Does it happen? Does this happen? Yeah, it actually, it actually surprisingly, it does. I mean, like, um, they'll, a lot of the time it's positive. You know, they'll, I say, oh, they'll text you and say, can I have a word? Or they may ask you, but you mentioned about, I'm not doing X mm. or Y properly. Uh, can you elaborate? And mm. yeah, that, that that's always good. You look, you're there to help players out or sometimes you'll see something because when you're preparing for games, you start to notice certain things and you might say it in the pre-match. They're not watching it because mm. they're preparing for the game or or it might be one of the players who's not playing and he's messaging you saying, completely agree with you or or this, that and the other. So, mm. you know, it, it's, it, that, as I said, it's, it's never personal. You're always doing it to, it's an observation that you make. It, it's an opinion. Football's about opinions. You're not always right. Some, um, I haven't had it yet where players have messaged me because they disagree with me or say, I can't believe you said that. Um, mm. so, and, you know, but I think it's players 
I've had a lot of players, including some of the national team players, message me just saying, even when it's been critical, I appreciate mm-hmm. it because at least you're being honest. And, you know, they take it like that. So I think people like that. Now. More or less, it's a healthy relationship between the players and the critics as well. Like you. Yeah, I think so. Mentioned. Yeah, I think that it's not just me. I think any any of the guys who do the 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 TV work mm. got a player. Um, you know, I think players understand that you have a role to do it, and look, players are thick skinned mm. as well. You what what we say on air is a lot more polite than what's said in a dressing room, um, and what's said on a training ground. So you know, it's if you're an experienced player, you you've got tougher skin, and if you've played um, football in for one of the big clubs in india like if you play for one of the big kolkata clubs you've heard a lot worse from the stands from mm. from the fans um so it's just if 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 you can deal with fans you can deal with social media you can deal with anything so it's and you know you have to that if you want to be a professional footballer you have to take uh, criticism with the with the adulation as well so so like we were all building up to this question so this was a build up question and i think you know where i'm going with the negative criticism there was an exchange of words between you and robbie fowler i believe in the previous season of isl um and things were went as rosy so can, can you tell me like can you can you can you elaborate that incident that happened with i think it was something involving bad referee decisions or something like that I think if you look at last season, um, I think I, actually, I was actually the pundit for the first uh, game that they had um, against uh, the, the derby game, and uh, the exchange was pleasant. Uh, I joked about them needing to sign a, a new striker, and it was a good good banter and exchange about you know if you know anyone, let me know. And said I shouldn't mm. believe in rumors about the new signing. Um, but I think over the course of the season, look, at, we've all been there as coaches when you're not winning and. you get frustrated you start um the blame game begins and i think the blame there was in these were games when i was on air where where it was mentioned about um the quality of the the refereeing which i think was spoken about by not just one coach mm-hmm. a lot of the coaches had mentioned it um but then it was the quality of the players was brought into question saying some of these had never been coached before yeah statements about this team was built for i league and, and so on and so forth and there was i think it was a it was a build up of a lot of uh, um sort of you could say excuses you could say um justifiable um you know, rationale behind why the team is performing a certain way and um, that match was i think the match in question was a very very heated match and um the both the benches had lost control and at that point a lot of teams um we're losing control on the benches and i think it happens when you know there's no there's no fans in the stadium everything gets amplified because pitch side microphones everyone can hear everything mm. so look i think post match interviews are terrible because you you're catching coaches at their most vulnerable you've just lost a game you're you're obviously pissed off and you don't want to be having questions asked about certain things but you know the job is sometimes to ask tough questions not to ask the easy questions we've all been there I've, i've had to come out of salt lake city and walk into a press room with you know, 50 60 journalists over there and mm. salt lake and asking grilling questions at you and you uh, you lo- you lose your cool sometimes yeah, it's, it's part and parcel of it it's nothing uh, what what said one day the next day you go and you laugh about it i'm sure so as i said it's just things get blown out of proportion but it's no big deal at the end of the season there's admiration i think the way um and some of those things were probably right if you look at that team that was built they did struggle and so sort of some of the things that were said were probably right by by the manager um mm. and i think you could see towards the end of the season that and some of the criticism was also justified as well so all things end well absolutely <clears throat> so i believe <clears throat> there will be a question and there is a question that everyone like every guest one of our channel comes and we ask them the same question so shubhankar would ask you the question shubhankar if you 
Okay, so sir, the last question I would like to ask you that uh, do you have any envision that of a project where India is actually qualifying for a World Cup, and uh, how soon or later can we implement? Sir, so, a question I've always been asked in the last ten years. Um, See, so yeah, I think the re the reality is. Look, if we're keeping the same way in terms of the same number of teams qualifying for a World Cup, it's we're a long way off. Um, all these projections you hear that twenty, you know, twenty six or twenty thirty or whatever is is just un, you know, it's just throwing numbers in the air and throwing them. There's no rationale behind it. Um, just showing hope. The reality is, look, when we're qualifying consistently every year for the Asian Cups, yeah. So I think if you look at the Asian Asian Cup, if AFC competition, we're qualifying every single tournament without fail, and then we're starting to progress out of the groups regularly. We're starting to get to the semis, challenging for top four. Then we can realistically say where we can start targeting the next World Cup campaign. If our youth teams, our under 17s, are qualifying for under 17 World Cups on merit, not because we're hosting. If our under 20 teams qualifying for under 20 World Cups or or doing well in the under 20 Asian levels, then we can say, okay, we're five years away. Because any team that's done well in a World Cup or any teams that have started to qualify for World Cups, teams that don't traditionally qualify, but now are getting in, especially from Asia. If you look at their mm. history, Japan qualify regularly, but Japanese youth are always in the top tiers. They make it to the final stages, in the, in, even in their youth. They, if it's an Asian competition, like the AFC Cups, Japan will be in the top four. Similarly, South Korea will be in the top four, and obviously now Australia will be. And so there's no way we're going to just suddenly leapfrog all these steps in development that you have to take to get there. So mm. um, that's, that's the reality. And, and I think the sooner we accept that's the reality and start building towards that, then the better, rather than just thinking that we can bypass all the steps that everybody else, every other country in the world is, is trying to get to the World Cup. And even the top team sometimes miss out, even the Italy's miss out, even the England's miss out and, the, you know, the France will miss out. Germany has mm. missed out. Um, I'm qualifying for a major tournament. So to think we're just going to just say, pick a number and say, yeah, we're going to qualify for that tournament is just not happening. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> moving on. I just last question and after that, we will be finishing this podcast. Like, okay, and we're taking a lot of time from you. So my last question would be, uh, like you know you were mentioning about you know development of indian football and th this question just pops up to my mind so like like you were telling that india isn't is is far off because you know when we have seen indian football and we expect you know when we see indian football and people are there and like hum hum bolte ki chai adda mein people we will we'll talk about you know why why india isn't playing like spain or why he isn't playing position football or this and that everyone's a critic out there but to get that, like whenever we play in ISL, like you have been a part of ISL, you have been a part of I League. Like there is a common trend. There is one one centre back from 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 outside. There would be one CDM, one creative player, and one striker. And that's the thing, you know. When we when we see now in India, we don't have a we have an abundance of wingers and fullbacks, but we generally don't have an that deep lying playmaker or that creative cam. We don't have that kind of players because we don't play them in top competition. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? See, I think it's a very, it's not inaccurate what you're saying, but I think it's too simplistic. And why I mean that is, are we producing at under 17 level, very good central attacking midfielders? very good ball playing center backs, very clinical strikers. I mean. mm. And so look at an under 17 AFC competition or a SAF competition. 
are we dominating those competitions with players who are dominating in, in the positions that you mentioned? I don't think so. At under 19 level, AFC under 19, do we have the best, um, you know, when, when they do the rankings of it, will scouts from foreign countries be looking at our under 19 defensive midfielders or center backs, etc.? I don't think so. So at the under 19 levels, there is no foreign center back. There is no foreign central attack midfielder or number nine. So why then are we not, you can, you can, your argument makes sense for beyond the senior team level that somebody is mm. in that position, but it doesn't make sense for before that level. So it all, almost always falls back. To, I think you guys had a chat with Ranjit last week and um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure he, would, he mentioned as well. Is, look, we don't play enough games at this, at the youth level. When our teams are playing, if our under 12s are playing 40 games a season, like what I was saying earlier when I coached in America, 40 games is easy for me with a youth, with a one particular youth team. So you think about it, those kids play 40 games from the age of 12 to 18, six, seven years, 250 games. Our teams don't, players don't play more than 50 games, competitive games. So you're so far behind the players abroad. So by the time you come to the senior team level, the reason you go and recruit a foreign attacking midfielder is because you don't have somebody who can do it as well as somebody who's struggling to do it abroad. Don't forget, there's another player that's, we're getting a player that's probably from the second or third tier from abroad, right? Not mm. there. So that's, that's where we have to address the problem rather than looking at it saying, this. I can understand if you're the national team coach. If you're a ghost team, mm. I get to see many players in this position. I send his point to you because his job is to just look for particular players who can play in an, he has to pick on 11 Indians and he needs to look in certain positions and he doesn't see enough across the league. So his, his point is valid, but in terms of why we don't develop them, I think development, you have to look at every level of development and why are we failing at each level? Why are we failing at under 12 or 14 or 16 or 18? And at each step, you've got to look at, are we doing the things properly? And I think that's where um, the reality is we're failing at every single step. Um, and so it's an easy deflection to just blame. And, you know, that's what a lot of the ex-players will say. They'll say, oh, this is why. But if you take away all the foreigners in the league and play an all-Indian I league, all-Indian second division, all-Indian ISL, mm-hmm. we're not going to suddenly, in five years' time, qualify for the World Cup. So it's... Uh, so, so that, in a way, that answers your question as well. So using that as an excuse doesn't solve the problem. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, sir, for coming to the podcast, sir. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure.